This is an oral history interview with Joe Brown Davis. We're in Nashville, Tennessee on March 12, 2009. The interviewer for the Albert Gore Research Center at MTSU is Professor Jim Williams. Uh, and this interview is for the Middle Tennessee Oral History Project at the Gore Center. So Mr. Davis, can you tell me where and when you were born? I was born in Cartersville, Georgia, 27th of May, 1919. What did your parents do there? Oh, we, they just lived on a farm. What? Uh, my my dad, he he left us, and left me and my mother and my two sisters, my sister and brother. And I couldn't finish but the fifth grade in school. I had to stop and go to work in a cotton field. What was Cartersville like? How big of a place was that? Well, at that time it was just a small place, but uh, uh, of course it's a good sized place now. Did you live right in town or on a farm? No, in a, in a farm way back of course I, I I didn't live long on this farm where I was born we went back to my granddad's property a county away and we lived back to the early 30s and I've been on my own since I was 13 years old my sister 10 my brother 16 on my own so you had there were three children in your family you had one brother and one sister well i had an older sister but she had she had got married by then okay. so there's four of you all together yeah what was it like growing up in the 20s <laughs> No running water, no phone, no electricity. Walk in the mud to a little one-room school. Was was there any fun? Sir? Was there any fun? It was all fun. <laughs> Having no electricity? That was no. Fun. Draw your water out of the well. As I said, I couldn't finish the fifth grade. I like to go to school, but in 1959, I took a, a post a test work at the post office, and I passed it. And I've been retired there since 1980. Mm. So why did you have to quit school? Dad left us. We didn't have no support. Finally. Mama got her lawyer, and he sent us twenty-five dollars a month till she got, till she remarried, and he he couldn't he he wouldn't work at nothing. She never did. I've been on my own ever since then. Uh -huh. So what did you do once you quit school? You were about ten years old. Uh, yeah, eleven. Well, we just. Pick cotton, chop cotton, and cut wood for people, and mm -hmm. things like that. What would uh, what would you earn on a good day back then? Well, when I was ten years old, I could pick a hundred pound of cotton. I got seventy five cents a hundred, but I didn't get but fifty cents a day for chopping cotton. <laughs> So how long did you uh, how long did you do that kind of work? Well, I just uh, me and my brother on up in 1937. Of course, in the meantime, we lived on Portland Farm twice. Uh, Doctor R. E. Fort's farm, and he paid us a dollar and a half a day. And boy, that's big money.
You said R. E. Ford. Doctor Ford. He was with National Life. He was a doctor with National Life Insurance. He said Canada Ford's. Okay. Dad. All right. So how did you get up up this way then? Well, we finally moved to Eddyville, Tennessee. In 1935, or we moved to Franklin. And then we got up there in the fall, and there was a farmer there close by. He used me and my brother to gather corn and, and thrash less potato, and he paid us a dollar and a half a day. There were cool springs is located now. Mm -hmm. What was your brother's name? J.W. Woodrow, and I, I didn't tell you, but I had an older brother, about 15 years older than me, half-brother he was. And we worked there, and then we got to cutting timber for baseball bats for a company in West Nashville that made manufactured baseball bats. And then... Uh, uh, in 1937, me and my brother bought us a new truck, a ton and a half truck. Cost thirty, it cost a thousand dollars for a ton and a half truck. And then we moved down here to the old 41 at Florence and and uh, got in the service station business for two years and like to starve. Mm. And we just cut timber and logs and just different things, anything to make a living. Now, these days, you hear a lot of comparisons that we're in a depression and it's the worst that it's been since the depression. What do you think of, of the comparisons? People today are comparing the situation now with the economy to the Great Depression. What do you think of that comparison? Well, uh, people that lived on a farm, now that don't include us, because we just lived on a farm, but people that had a farm and parents to farm, uh, they didn't know too much about a depression. They just had their cattle, their milk, and their garden, and that, that's all they knew. But uh, people can't make it on 8 or $10 an hour. How are you going to buy a house on a uh, a hundred thousand dollar house on that kind of money. You can't do it. So did you struggle during the 30s to keep keep going? Well, I, I couldn't hardly bought the Brooklyn Bridge for a dime. I didn't hardly have a dime. So how'd you keep going? just working on a farm, cutting logs. We cut a lot of cardwood for Hardison Brick Company here in Nashville. They used to make brick till they had this smoke abatement thing and they had to heat the kills with wood till they mm -hmm. couldn't just put coal in it. But I've never had a car note. I've never had a house note. Now, for a fifth grader, that's bragging a little bit. Sounds like hard work, though. I just enjoyed working. I've been down here in this garden waiting for it to get daylight when I used to tend you know. Now, did you, uh, did you benefit from any of the New Deal programs? The WPA or the CCC? I wasn't really old enough to get on the WPA, but my oldest brother, he, he couldn't get on it, too. You had to kind of know somebody to get on it. Hmm. Did you know anyone in the CCC? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you think of Franklin Roosevelt? <laughs> I think he sat back on the haunchers and it cost us 405,000 men. Right there in the World Book. 405,000. In the war, you mean? Yes, sir. 
So do you think we should have gotten in it earlier? I just think we should have been prepared. So you mentioned uh, before we got started that uh, your wife was from Smith County? Yes. Where? What was her name and how did you meet? Ruby Barry. How did... How did you meet? Oh... <laughs> It, at that time, at it, the parks on Saturday night, they showed movies. And I lived in East Nashville, and she lived a second house from the park she was working in. And uh, I decided to drive over there that night, and I walked up to these people watching the movie. And... I noticed uh, this pretty girl st standing there close to me, and uh, <coughs> I noticed a, a soldier over there that he looked like he was trying to nudge over close. So, so I said, "I better make my move," and I walked up to her and went to talking and. I was just parked across the street, and I said, well, let's go over and sit down in my car and talk while she wasn't doing it. And I said, well, I'll give you the keys. And so we did. And so that just went a little further and a little further. This was three or four weeks before I went in the arm. So that was in 1942? Two. Okay. And you said that she, uh, growing up in Smith County, knew Albert Gore Sr. Yes. He he had signed her her report card. Is that what you said? Yeah. So what was she like? What was she like? Mm -hmm. Oh, she was just a sweet. Uh, we lived together sixty. Four years, I believe. My daughter lives over there. Okay. She had Bryce disease when she was eight months old. Mm. She, she sees after Papa. Okay. So you met right before you left for the war uh -huh. so did you keep up with R ruth during the oh war? yes yes is that what some of the v-mail is yes sir. okay i think she said oh well. there's some in here Read to see which one it is. I mean, it's addressed to Miss Miss Ruby Berry on Long Avenue in Nashville. That's right off of Shelby. This is the next week. And you're Private Joe B. Davis. Yeah. Um. One thirty third Infantry Regiment. That's the thirty fourth Division. After I went to Italy. And it's Christmas Day in Italy, 1943, is yeah. that right? That was just before Casino. You say, Dearest Darling, I thought I would hear from you by today, but I haven't. But I know it isn't your fault. I guess you were at your mother's today. Let's hope we can be together next Christmas. And we can go to your mother's together. Um, she was awful nice to me. The rest was too. Has anyone heard from William yet? I wonder if he is over here or in the Pacific. Darling, I love you. Bye now. Joe B. Davis. <laughs> so who is William? William, believe it or not, my older brother 10 years ago William's 
was sent to the Pacific, but we went together to Croft. But he died from smoking 15 mm -hmm. years ago or what. And my brother met up with her, and we knew her. Ruby knew her. And uh, she, he married Williams with her. Okay. Who is that there? This is to Ruby on May 4th, 1944. From you. May the 4th, 1944. What, what kind says? of address did I give myself? Signal Company? That says uh, 133rd Infantry Regiment. Well, that was just before I left to go to, to come back. She's in Brush Creek, Tennessee. Yeah. That's a water town there on the road that runs from Alexander to Carthage. Now, how did she get from Nashville to Brush Creek during the war? Oh, she was well, Tennessee in... Central train. Well, did she have family in Brush Creek? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. She was born and raised there. Okay. Little community called Homes of Gallup, right on the railroad that runs into Brush Creek. Okay. Just wondering how my sweetheart is by now and if you are still in the hospital. Wait a minute, that she was in the hospital? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. What, something minor. Uh, I was just to think, darling, I was wanting to know how you were and Mrs. Williams just came in and brought me your big fat letter which I had just started writing you a oh, while I had just started writing you I was so thrilled to know you got my pictures and your mail precious there wasn't anything that could have pleased me any better I left all of my airmail paper at home so this was all I had to write on I will get some when I go to town um, Wait a minute, where was I at? It says, uh, well, it looks like that might be crossed out. The address is in 30, 133rd Infantry Regiment, APO, New when York. When I go to town, <laughs> I, I don't know. What was that Williams that brought you a letter, did you say? I don't know. It says Mrs. Mrs. Will, WMS Williams, I assume. Just came in and brought me your big fat letter. Boy, that don't make sense. I mean, I don't know. Who is, who is that one? That one's from you to Miss Mrs. Lizzie Davis. Ask to my mother. Read, read that. Oh, oh, well, okay. Wait a minute. Okay. This last one was. It was from Ruby to you. Okay. Oh, so oh, that's what, oh. You understand how that was made. Uh -huh. well, that email was just like an envelope. You write on it, and then they put it off on tape, and then put it on. I was getting the return address and the other mixed up. Okay. Uh -huh. So that was Ruby writing to you that your uh, Mrs. Williams came in and gave gave her your big fat letter. Uh, anyway, so... And she's asking if you were still in the hospital in May of 44. So is that when you were wounded? No, that, uh, that was later. I, blood pressure got so high and I couldn't keep nothing on my stomach. Okay. They just put me in the hospital. Your mother tried to squeeze a lot on here. It's kind of... Oh, is that from my mother to me? Yes. Oh. Uh, dear son, Joe, we received a letter from you today. This is January 11th, 44. Uh, January the 11th. I was in casino. So, uh, but I, I didn't get that. I don't think I'll come back to the States. You do well to read her writing, honey. She never <laughs> went to school. I, it's, it's just small. She says, I wish you could get your box of papers. We never did get that purple heart. Well, I sent mine home. Give it to me from Sicily. 
and uh, they never did get it. So, more here. Okay, this one is to you from J.W. Clifton. Yeah, that's my brother-in-law. Now, his wife is still living. She's in a, a home up here in Clarksville. She's the only one of the family that's living. He was in the Army in peacetime in the Pacific, and he got out, and a couple of years later, of course, they drafted him. But he made a mess sergeant in the artillery. I don't think he ever... This says he was in Belgium. Well, in. yeah, he, he was in the hospital there. And the man's boy sat around talking. He says, boy was telling about the army, you lose anything and make you pay for it. This boy says, I, I know they can't do it. Says, I was on Tennessee maneuvers and said, I got sick and I lent my gun up against a cedar tree and went to the hospital and before I went, said they get, tried to get me to sign the paper. I said I wouldn't do it. My brother-in-law listened to him. You know what he told him? No. He says, I got you going at the house now. My wife ain't, that was on their place, just a block away. She found that gun and gave it to him. He hadn't went in. I done come back from overseas when he went overseas. Uh -huh. And the small world. So he was on the maneuvers. Here. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, he he was on maneuvers up here close. I mean, he, Jim was mm -hmm. close enough that he he was a sergeant, and the, his officer let him have the jeep to drive down there to <laughs> his wife staying with I'll be. her mother. Okay. You got a lot of these. Oh, I, I've got. I didn't know I did have so many. It seemed to me like I got about a hundred letters after I come home. And we was opening them up, and Ruby said, here's the one, let's, let's don't open it. Let's, it's here somewhere. This is from you to Irene Baskin? That's her sister. And you're in Italy in December of 43. Yeah, New New Year's of Party Three, we was moving up to Casino. Back far enough, we're staying in pup tents. I pull my combat boots off and set them on it. All that night, it snowed. It done everything. Mm. Next morning, my shoot boots was full of ice. I beat it out with my steel helmet and drove them home. The house back there, I told this boy, I said, let's see if we can go back there and find enough stuff to build up a bar and dry our feet. So up about dinner time, I says, man down here, in the artillery gun, I says, I'm going to walk down there and talk to the Lord. I walked down there and they was lined up a chow. I just walked up to him, went to talking to him. I says, are you from Georgia? He says, yes. I said, your name Rogers? He said, yes. He's my cousin. I hadn't seen him since I was seven, eight years old when wow. I just recognized him. There's one to Ruby. You're still in Italy. I don't remember writing this many in Italy. I don't. I don't know how I could have done it. Well, this one's on March the third. This one's on March the ninth. Um, here's one from her. I guess December forty-three. There should be one in there that I give a signal core outfit at my address. When I was put in limited service, they sent three or four of us up there and it stayed about a month. These still say infantry regiment. And uh, this first lieutenant, which run it, says either one of you boys can drill a man. I, I said, yeah, I can drill a platoon of men. 
So he says, take them and just drill the fire out of them. And I did, and you know that lieutenant gave me a letter of recommendation. I'm here somewhere now that when people just do something nice for you, when they don't have to, uh, you appreciate it. Oh, I've got a bunch of these things. But when I got back, well, we landed there in New York, and we come back in a, a ship by ourselves, a little, what they call a victory ship. And uh, come on down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and processed us and give us three weeks. Said, this just delay en route. Said, it won't be against you. Now this one is uh, Italy, May 21st, and your address is the 229th Signal. Uh huh. Yeah. Now that was just before May the what? 21st. Well, that is six days before my birthday. So I spent my birthday on that ship. That was just before. That was where the fellow was so nice there. Says, boys, get on this weapons carry. We're going to carry you. Oh, we had to catch a train to take you in Naples. You're going home. Okay. Man, what a feeling it is when you see that old Statue of Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I'll tell you this one. Um, I let, guess you've let, seen enough of this. Well, let me back up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so... What do you remember about Pearl Harbor? Well, I was going across Shelby Avenue on a Sunday morning when Roosevelt come on the air. And they told about it. This day will live in infamy. What did you think that meant for the country? Well, uh, uh, I knew it didn't mean nothing good. And, 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 and me, 22 years old. So you suspected eventually you'd get called up? Well, sure. I'd have been called up. Uh, my mother was my dependent. I'd have... Just like my cousin, he said he spent three years overseas. Can you imagine that? Eating them C and K rations for three years. So you uh, you were delayed some because of your mother? Well, sure. She never did work at public works. She wasn't able. So why did you eventually get drafted? Why? Well, you register, they put you in class so-and-so, uh, class 1B or what, and then as they get short of men, they put you in another class. In other words, my brother didn't get drafted to up late because he had to, uh, three children at the time, so uh, they was keeping down on money. They didn't. I've got paid seventy five dollars a month. You now they pay it? them about three thousand a month. So this um, registration card says you registered on the sixteenth of October. I can't make out the year. Would that have been? 41 that you read yeah so you were registering before the Pearl Harbor you... no 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 I don't I don't know but I can't read it this. says you have duly registered the 16th day of October and I can't read the the year but you were living on Crutchen Street Crutcher Crutcher Street in Nashville that's right there, next to 
the river. Well, that would have had to been oh, that had to been forty one. So you were, they started to draft before Pearl Harbor. Then. You were five eleven, weighed one hundred and thirty eight. <laughs> Uh, light complexion, brown hair, gray eyes. If you're called. underweight, you gain it. If you're over, you lose it. Let me Climbing. Up. So, what? Um, how did life change after the war? After the United States got in the war? Well, you mean before you went in the military? Before you did. Just in general, how did things... In well, the they, they went to dry, uh, ration and everything. I don't remember this one. Mm -hmm. When they started, they started out, they wouldn't sell you any gasoline at night. I went over to East Tennessee from Nashville and down into Georgia visiting. I know I was going in and I... I had to wait there till daylight to get some gas. Were you still in the service station business then? No, we didn't stay in it long. We liked to starve to death in it. So what were you doing for work? When Sir? The, what were you doing for work when the war started? Well, as I said, we was there about a year and a half and uh, see when it started. Well, we went down to Kentucky Lake and hauled a lot of logs. The Corps of Engineers built that lake yourself. It wasn't contracted. And uh, we hauled uh, logs out and sold them there at Paris and just anything that we could get to do make a living. Did you ever think of volunteering? No, sir. If there's any feeling in the world, when you go up, go up on a Jersey side on a train and get out, and walk them two barracks bags and get on a barge and go over and cross the bay. And there sits that ship. Boy. What a feeling. To a boy that's never been away from home. So you weren't real gung-ho about joining up? No, sir. And was that because you needed to take care of your mother? Or you just didn't care for the idea of going Well, around? my sister had got old enough that uh, she'd got a job with General Shu, mm -hmm. And she took care of her. But don't hold it against me because I was drafted it. So was most of the other yeah, people. I'm, I'm not. I'm just well, wondering. I shouldn't have said that to you. <laughs> um, you. But you do hear the stories of people that... You do hear stories of people that went and signed up the next day and so yeah. on. Yeah. Um, so when you, when you did get called up, what um, did you just get a letter? Uh, I was on draft board number two. They, they had draft boards, and mm -hmm. I guess you'd call it prominent people run the draft boards. And when they put me in one A, I, I called them up there and told them, I said, when do you think I'll have to go? And she said, it won't be long, just a few days. So in a few days, they said, come up at the Union Station, so-and-so. We got on a train and went to Camp Forest. And then we went from there to Oglethorpe at Chattanooga. I, I believe I told you wrong a while ago. But, boy, you try to sleep and all that trays are rattling upstairs. Oh, mercy. Well, what was it like at Camp Forest? 
Well, I, I wasn't there, but just a day or two. Uh, I'm not sure whether we was really sworn in there or at Ogleborg. Where did the basic training come in? At Camp Croft, South Carolina. Okay. What was that like? Well, I, I could just take everything the Army could dish out. I made such a score on the firing range, the M1, that they sent a 6 by 6 Army truck just to get me and haul me back to the back out of hundreds of men. The lieutenant come by, soldier, where are you from, Tennessee? I said, yes, sir. Where'd you learn to shoot? Well, I never did own a twenty two rifle. The neighbor boys did, and I don't know, uh, uh, them Brooklyn boys. <laughs> oh, man. Went to tying out the M1 apart one rainy day there in the barracks and putting it back together. The sergeant began talking about zeroing a gun in. I knew what he was talking about, but them Brooklyn boys could ask him a thousand questions. So what was it like meeting guys from all over the country? Well, uh, I guess it was pretty interesting. You see, I just, I just took six weeks of infantry training. All I fired was just a rifle. Uh, having a truck, well, they classified me as a truck driver. Okay. I went to seven weeks truck driving school. And the sergeant there, when we left, says, boy, says, I could have treated you like you was trash, but I don't believe in that. I believe in treating you like somebody. So when I got to Italy, they sent me and a few more out there to throw hand grenades practicing. I looked behind me as the instructor, and there he was. <laughs> And him and his brother went on up there to, to Angio, that landing they made behind him, and one of them got killed. I never didn't know which one it was. But he, he was a nice fellow. So you were in Georgia, or South Carolina, for a couple months? Se 17 weeks, I think. It was. Well, I guess it's 13 weeks. So you shipped out to North Africa? And well, they sent us to a little camp in Pennsylvania, just built. I guess that was February, always hit muddy. And uh, we stayed right there too, and I walked up to the PX, and this boy that I went to school with, some in Georgia had to sign, got his parents to sign for him to go in the army. And my cousin told him, don't do it. They'll send you straight over on it. Next time I seen him in Georgia, he was living in a crib just like a baby. Mm -hmm. Spine case. I met him going to the PX. Mm -hmm. What did you do in Pennsylvania? Huh? What did you do at that camp in Pennsylvania? Oh, wait just uh, uh, oh, I know they're just kind of slowing us up to get to the port of embarkation by the time I made up this convoy. So what was the ship like that you went over on? Sterling Castle, British, big ship. British food, if you want to call it. Oh, they fed us. They gave me a job helping carry meat out of the freezer, biggest two rooms. Mm -hmm. Oh, mercy. And I just got out of the hospital with the measles. And they fed us fish with the eyes and head still on. 
and the eggs it just all but stunk and that mutt oh <laughs> day we landed I asked one of the cooks I said can you cook me a steak he said yeah I'll chop it and he just had it good when he laid my mess kit this kind of a red blood run out I said oh <laughs> You didn't care for the mutton? Oh, mercy. My wife always heard me say I couldn't eat goat. We went up there one time the other day, they killed beef and this and that. And she brought some meat back to the house. She didn't tell me she cooked it. I tasted of it. I said, man, that's the best beef I ever ate. She began laughing. <laughs> she says, you know what that is? So where did you land in Europe? All around in Algeria. What was that like compared to back home? Oh, we walked through around. The sun is shining on that city being in a desert. The rock, stone, it's glasses. Oh, when you got up there and eat. They had a thing you just walk up to in the street. That's that's not going to come across on the tape. What are you doing? Huh? You're you were signaling. You mean they would just walk up and urinate in the street? Okay. <laughs> you ain't got no camera on, are you? No. I see people with a, I call it elephantitis. Uh-huh. How long were you there? Uh, just three or four days. And they called us out one day and they called eight or ten truck drivers. And uh, we went up there. For I don't know how far, and they loaded us up with artillery shells. But back to this canistel, they called it that old ran. Well, it was called Camp? What did you say? It was, it was called canistel, it's right at the edge of old ran. But they had a government sponsored brothel. Mm -hmm. Brothel, is that what you're saying? French Arab. Mm -hmm. What did you think of that? I thought it was awful. Was that that was for the soldiers? They were doing that for the soldiers. Well, for everybody? it was bound to know because you had to take a probe before you. My old buddy that I was with, he thought he'd slip me in there one night. And I said, "Oh, I ain't going in there." I told him, "P, no, I ain't been in there." So he, he let me go. My mind wasn't on such as that. Yeah. So. What happened next? Well, we we drove up there and they loaded us up and we drove one up so far and turned our trucks in and then that's when they lined us up and there come this warrant officer what was over then in Africa with her service records. And, of course, I, I knew when he got to me that that score. Oh, your, your and, rifle score? Yeah, and, of course, I'd gained weight then that I probably weighed, you know, 145 pounds or what. And finally, he said, uh, how much do you weigh? 
And I said, oh, about 145 or 50. If I'd have said it, 160, 170, I know what he'd done. He'd assigned me to a heavy arms company, mortars, uh, mm -hmm. machine guns. But instead you were infantry? Where, what did they assign you to do? To do? Mm -hmm. I was just in a, a rifle company. Did, did you know that um, you said the war in Africa was over? Did you know what was coming next? Well, I knew something. It wasn't no good. Uh, anyway, we got on uh, these LCIs. Landing craft infantry hold about a company of men. Went on up, went on up, went on up, and went around a tip of Tunisia and was headed towards Libya, but just right there. And uh, uh, well, we 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 was just training there from March till tenth of July. We we was just training the first division as well. And then uh, uh, we loaded up one day and went around the point there just a little bit and uh, got off and went out there and eat dinner with the British. Had a kitchen set up there. And then that night, well, we loaded up on these LCIs and I believe it ain't too far from Tunisia to Sicily, but I believe we spent the next day and anchored out there a pretty good while. And then we started off again, and we pulled right in there in Sicily. They always land just, just before daylight. And they opened up on us with the artillery and they hit the LCI and killed a sailor fixing to let the ramp down. And he throwed it in reverse and went around out to another place and we got off pretty good. And they, they said that it sat there and sunk. I don't know. I never did get my belongings. But that night then, and these big naval guns firing over our head, we started up a blacktop road. And the lieutenant, well, we don't expect nothing much but just a little small arm fire. And it was going up through the column on each side and in this ditch. Man, oh man. We was headed right towards your house. It was high off the ground. And uh, they opened up with machine guns and hitting right on this pavement right by the side of us. Oh, mercy. And then up on the hillside below us, they throwed a hand grenade, which theirs is on a stick, call them potato smash. Boy, it's about the second it in front of me. I never will forget what he said. He, he said they blowed my damn arm off. Well, the lieutenant gave orders to back up. And we went up on a hill and dug in. Our tanks hadn't got off. So the Germans standing way back out there sent the Italians at us. Oh. And when they got up close enough to us, he, he surrendered. And a boy named Smith from New York shot him with a rifle grenade and just blowed his head off. And in a few days he got killed, got shot right in the head. Well, 
they hollered, the tanks was headed toward us, get out. So we went back and the boy, our small artillery was all, but they seen us come in and they started throwing shells at us. And they finally detected it was us. And this boy said, let's go down to the ship. Ships. I says, no. I says, there's an airport right over this hill. Uh, planes will be over here. So it was pretty quiet there. And about 3 o'clock in the evening, a fighter plane to come in from the east out of the 3 o'clock sun, and he just got up high enough that he could just coast in. Boom, boom. And that ship blowed up. I, I've got got it in there on Collier's photographic history of World War Two. I, I want to show you. Okay. And I've I've got a picture of it. This hit it. It just broke up. That book tells who took every picture in there. Associated Press, Army, or what? So this was in 1943? 43. And what month? We landed on the 10th. Of what month? July. July, okay. D-Day in France was the 6th of June, you know. So what happened next? You were, this was the first time you were under fire, right? Yeah. What you've been telling well, me. we just started moving up through Sicily, and uh, we took Sicily, you know, in about five weeks. And uh, we went up out of one place, and uh, you see, the Germans would fall back, and they'd have certain objects done zeroed in to where they could drop an artillery shell or what at a good place they figured you'd get. So we went up there one place and a rock just jetted up just like that, high as your head. And the lieutenant said, so I started up there towards him. And just before I got there, they dropped a mortar shell just direct, you know, him and the boy or two, and a piece of it. <laughs> we was up there in Italy. Well, one night, I stayed all night, two or three boys in an old house. They began throwing shells down in on us. Well, I told that boy, I said, man, that, this old house will fall in if they hit it. And there was a ditch out there in front, high as your head, just 10 foot from the steps. So I decided to walk out there and, man, if I'd been that much later, the shell hit right where I was and it just, Old mud back on me. They kept throwing them in there, throwing them in there. And there was a road culvert right there. And I finally just got up there and I crawled in there. But up there in Italy, they was told, men in a tank, that there wasn't nobody. Well, let me get this another. This tank of ours pulled up to this high ditch, and there was two men in it, and they stopped there. And the, the Germans sold an 88 at them and hit that tank, and they jumped out. And they started running around a little sharp hill, and it looked like you could just the next one just, and it just hit them. So 
So what was it like seeing all of this? Huh. It made you think of wanting to be back home with your mama in Tennessee. Did you really have time to think about things? Well, we stayed all night in the barn one night. And it was raining. And laying on hay. And, oh, uh, you go to sleep and be dreaming about back home and all that stuff rattling to get up. And oh, I ain't at home, I'm here. Up by in Casino, oh, we dug in back here in the monasteries up down there, far from here to Elm Hill. Mm -hmm. Our guns just coming back so far that you couldn't hear them go off. You could hear them go over. The second night I went to sleep, and they began falling behind us and among us. Me and a boy run up and run back here and told them at this command house what was happening. And uh, the next day, I believe it was, this big oak tree, the only tree there was in that country, Captain went up out of it, and I know what we're fixing to do. They've done made two attack, attacks on Casino unsuccessfully. So they began throwing mortars, and they hit on the other side of the tree. I could hear the fin on every one of them. It just numb the side of my head, and I, can, I don't hold up on to it now. And that's the only thing that saved me, I was on that side. But there in Casino, there one day, well, we was crawling for some reason, and uh, they began throwing some shells too close to me. And there was a ditch there, and the Germans had been bivouacked down here off of the Casino Mountain. So that was a latrine ditch. So you can guess what happened. I hit that ditch and went to crawling. Mm. And I had to keep them clothes on. Mm. So, um, were you, you were fighting for five weeks in Sicily? Pretty much nonstop? Yeah, I was there uh, uh, five or six weeks. Was it mostly Germans or Italians you were fighting? No, see, Italy done surrendered. Italy surrendered, you see, when we, uh, I think, by the time they landed it in Italy, oh, you know, Italy surrendered. Well, they thought they'd have it easy. Well, it wasn't. A, the Italians didn't want to fight us, no way. Uh, they're good people. What did you think of the Germans as, as fighting? No, I told the boys, I said they'll be fighting when the Americans and allies meet the Russians. Now the Germans had to be behind Hitler or that wouldn't have happened. Did you get to know the uh, Sicilians, the local folks? Oh, the men and other boys stayed all night in the house one night, and they cooked us winter greens. We give them sea rations. So were they, did they seem happy to have the Americans? Oh, yes. Now, I'll tell you what happened to show you who this for. They're in Sicily. I got hit. Another boy got shot right through there, come out at his back, missed his heart some way. There was a little country house there. So we jumped, running, jumped in that. And 
German sniper left behind right here on a hill that's close, he seen us. So I got him in there, and the woman got the bread off of the bed. They cook a lot of pounds of bread. That place up here in the side of the far place. Mm -hmm. She got it off. I put sulfur drugs on him. And oh, he was in pain. And the old man, we thought he was old. He uh, went out in the yard. It was nearly dark. He knew the Germans would be over there. And you run out of tape. Oh, this is a good time. He stayed out in the yard. This is on the 3rd of August. And sure enough, they come up. And I told the boy, I said, we'll have to get under the bed. The runner said no. And he told German that we'd left. Laid his life on the line for us. He come in the house and he said, if they come back, that's international language. The hand across the throat is what yeah. you did. Um, any other stories like that from Sicily that you remember? Close calls. I, I assume, well, you, you saw people get killed and wounded. Were there any particularly close friends of yours? Uh, uh, oh, you, you didn't have too many close friends. You I, I got out. For well, two or three days, it'll show them on there, I guess, of a mules to take rations at night up in the mountains, and I've done that for two or three days, and then they could watch a, I call them gooms from Australia come over there, and they put them to doing it. Now, at that time, we was right down under this mountain, and up here's the monastery, but they couldn't see us from up there. So one evening, late in the evening, here come these horses and mules with these Australian gooks leading. I told the boy, I said, oh, look at you. If they'd have stayed back there in these olive groves, they couldn't have seen them till dark. Here they come. I says, oh, mercy. They let them get down there close and pow, 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 pow. And I'd blame artillery and just slaughter them. Did you have any rest between Sicily and Italy? Oh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, I went back to the hospital, and I stayed there a pretty good while. I had trouble with my neck, uh, hurting, and my, they cut my teeth through. They gave me an up and downer, and I don't know what all they gave me. They tried to get my blood pressure down. And I got some replacements there in Casino one day, right down under this hill. Just every once in a while a shell was hitting that China, a small one. This one boy, oh, he was a dude. He talked. Says, what do y'all do for pussy over here? It's okay. I says, buddy, before day, you'll probably get something near his hand on your mind and that. <laughs> oh, after a while, they throw the shells over it. Oh, mercy. That old house that just shook the dust down in our head. He got this as quiet. So that was the farthest thing from your mind when all this was happening? Oh, mercy. 
Didn't have time to think about things like that. Uh -oh. Carrying on, carousing. Um, so how long were you, you were in the hospital in Tunisia, did you say? When I went back to Tunisia. And that was for blood pressure. Yeah, and just different things. Mm -hmm. So you hadn't been wounded yet. That happened later, or yeah. Okay. Oh no! Wait, 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 wait a minute now! Wait, wait a minute now! Wait, wait, wait a minute now! <sighs> I went from Sicily to to me to the hospital. But yeah, that's where I couldn't keep nothing on my stomach. They gave me the up and down, and they was looking for cancer, and they gave me this, and they gave me that. I was there quite a while from fifth of August to gosh, I don't know. I guess October. And that must have been a welcome change, or were you itching to get back to the the front? Well, really, I shouldn't have been sent back on account of my, my nerves, my stomach, and different things, but. So you were sent back in October? Uh, I think it was about October. We got on an old barge and went right by Malta. Mm -hmm. One old boy says, I live there. And while we was in Italy one night, we stopped and the country road a steep bank, and the Germans had blowed up this man's house to stop up this road. And we stopped by, and it was rain. We got some of that wood and built us up a fire. And the old man come up there, and he says, I give so many thousand lire for this house. Look at it now. Stop burning the wood. I'll tell the captain. And I said, yeah, this is a rough war. Anyway, we was right outside of a little bitty town, Piedmont. This one boy said, my grandmother lives down there. So the captain told him, he says, well, go ahead. And the sir says, get back by dark. One boy was there in the hospital with the name of Gash kept up at Red Ball and Springs. I went by there to go and see him one day. And his daddy said he went to Detroit, got a job up there. But I went to see some boys that lived in Gainesburg that was in my rifle company. Talking about uh, can up rushing on a mule. There's a boy there waiting to go home by the name of Kelly. And we was back and going up at night and he had two cans of sea ration cans of heating a can of a stew or something. It wasn't heating fast enough to suit him. So he poured some gas out. It always gas can sitting around there. And another can. And I says, now Mole, we called him Mole. I says, when you slide that up there, I said, your nerves is bad and you're going to jump. I said, you're fixing to get burned. So we went sliding it up there. He 
he went to running through the door. I told that other boy, I said, grab that blanket over there quick. And I grabbed him. Hmm. Now you mentioned Monte Cassino, Cassino several times. Did you, did you actually get up to the monastery eventually? Uh, we was headed this way. That looks like it's just a hill the way it is. Mm -hmm. But the main part of the town was around over here. If you cut us off of that, I'm going to go get a book over here. Okay. Show me something. Well, I mean, uh... You want to put them back? I will. I want to. Oh, this is made during the war. This is my wife, Southern Manufacturing Company. She's in there somewhere in her system. Oh, okay. That's took off. Now, right around in here is where I spent so much time, but uh, I got a better picture than that. So, we're looking at a, a book called The Collier's Photographic History of World War II. You mentioned that earlier. So. Now there, it tells who made these pictures. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't, it's one, two, three, four. I see, okay. You know, uh, yeah, when it, he was showing me that he's up down the street of Salem, I turned it to right here, I said, yeah. Now this shows more of the mountain, this is a castle. Mm -hmm. and, and here, the main town is around over here. Now, keep that in mind. So uh, you all were down here thinking that you needed to get up there at some point. Well, uh, that, this was uh, December, January, February. Uh, after they bombed us over, this, this, this casino didn't fall until up in May. There's a much photograph picture right there. That's over in the Pacific someplace. Now, for instance, say you want to see, uh, that's one, two. All right, what page is this? Uh, this is a number somewhere. Well, there's, there's, uh, well, here's how we can do it. Must be somewhere. Now, what what page is this? Fifty-five. Oh, that's fifty-six. Fifty-six okay. two. I see. So it's uh, international. It says international press, or it just says international. Yeah. And then this one is. I don't know uh, what that is. United China Relief. I don't know what it's that a, is. It's Chung Chung King being bombed. Oh. Uh. I've been there. <laughs> now, now here's where this is Troy and Sicily. I, I could see the Mount Etna over here. See, this is going. So we're looking on page 151 now. And it says, U.S. forces press on through Troyna. The house is right back here. Just that little house is right back here. Which was captured on August 6, 1943 by the 7th Army under General Patton yeah. in the toughest battle our troops had fought to that time. This town was a focal point of the German defense line in northern Sicily, 50 miles distant from Messina. In northern, huh? Sicily. Uh, 50 miles you distant. Want to see who, you want to see who took that? Uh, 151. That's number one on page what? 151. There we go. Well. There they are. Uh, international. International again, huh? Well, let's see now. Oh, yeah, wait a minute, I'm going too far.
Him will go. Okay, now we're on page 146. Now, he, he's fixing to jump in Sicily. And our own Navy shot down, I forget how many of them, thinking they was Germans. And you could just, I want to say I could see the U.S. stars, but now, I, well, anyway, right here is a ship right here. Okay. No. I'm right close to it. Right here. It says 147. Uh, the American cargo ship seen in the two above pictures is shown as the explosion from gasoline and munition stores reached its full burst of destructive splendor. A number of hours uh, elapsed between the time the Nazi bomb struck the ship and the final explosion. Hello. Hello. How are you? That, that's my little loving daughter, Hi. Angel Without Hi. Wings, Linda. Careful of the cords. Yeah, there. oh, what about is this going to be put at? What you're at doing? MTSU? MTSU? Yeah. Uh-huh. What, what program is it with? Um, well, I, I work at the Gore Center. Uh-huh. And that's where it's a... It's an archive at MTSU okay. and library, so. So the part that he'll be in will be dealing with the history of World War II. We interview veterans uh, from all the wars, so uh -huh. uh, he'll, he'll be one of the World War II veterans. So okay. We just saved the interview, and if anybody wants to use it for research, uh, oh, they, okay. they can. So this will only be up there. The actual interview we keep, yeah. but um, we notify the Library of Congress uh -huh. in Washington, and they have the information okay. so that if people are looking there, for instance, yeah. for information about the battles he was in, yeah. they would know where to go to get the... Maybe you can help me. He may have one or two or more items that we may want to put somewhere, like in a museum, but we don't know how to go about, or we don't know who might be interested. He's got a jacket, mm -hmm. and he's got a canteen, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? Well, we we take things like that. If you wanted to donate it to the Gore Center, um, I could I could check other other museums local. I'm not sure if the State Museum would want it, but the State Museum here in Nashville. Uh, they've, right. they've got my picture up there. Uh, it it just depends. We we have we have a few things that veterans have donated to MTSU. Um, it just depends on where you you want yeah. it to go. Uh, us or the state museum probably would be the most likely. To put it. Mm -hmm. Well, so. we'll think about it. We we just. Thinking about things. Right. There's a lot of nice uh, memories and family history here. Your letters to your mother. And so, uh, you're a professor up there? I am, uh huh. A history professor. I'm confused. How did them go or enter into it? <laughs> um, Albert Gore Sr. Senior, yeah. What was an. He went to MTSU. Oh, okay. And, and he gave us his papers when he retired in okay. 1970. So they named this archive after him. Oh, okay. I was thinking of the younger guy. No, it's, okay. it's, it's his father. Uh, his father was actually signed a piece of paper that I told him had. about that. He was her school superintendent up in Smith County. Right, right. <laughs> So that, that Albert Gore, yeah. Now, that Albert Gore. I wonder what the, so, so Albert Gore Sr. went up there to MTSU. He graduated in 1932. Oh, okay. I wonder that. And he ran for Congress down there at Fayetteville. That's what it was, the 4th District. In 38. Uh, well, well, now here is this castle. Keep that in mind. Okay. And here is what this looked like down here. Yeah, what did you say, Daddy, at Fayetteville? What did you say, Gore ran? For Congress. Carthage is in the 4th District. Yeah. Now, he ran for Senator. That's statewide. Okay. I he, told him. He mentioned that he saw um, Gore Sr. give a speech, was it, in Fayetteville? Yeah. 
Fayetteville. Had his pedal. Had his pedal. But what was he doing in Fayetteville? Honey, I just got to tell you, that's oh, the fourth yeah. district. The, the district runs all the way down to the Alabama line. The fourth district? That's a long way from Columbus. Well, I can't help that. I didn't set it out that way, honey. This is the fifth district. It's it still is that way. Uh, Bart Gordon's district runs all all down through. You can talk uh, about for the Senate. No, for the House of Representatives. House of Representatives. He was a congressman first. Who? who? Okay. Well, uh, is it, you mean Gordon? Oh, he's still Congress. The Bart Gordon now. Uh, uh, and well, actually, Lincoln Davis's district is the one that is Smith County and down oh, okay. down through. Some of those districts are real long and narrow. They yeah. they go well, from now, Alabama. Now, Miss uh, Miss yeah. uh, Janice Bowling mm -hmm. run against Davis, but she lost. Mm -hmm. I met her over at the Veterans Memorial one day. Uh, well, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for <laughs> stopping by. Yeah. Here's a castle. Here's this. Here's this. I'll, I'll, uh, they'll have my information if you need to get in oh, touch with me for any well, reason. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Nice to meet you. Okay, so here's the. Here's, here's the castle right here. And here is this right here. Wow. So that, that was just flattened. And uh, here's where the monastery is set. So we're on, you're on page 196 and 197 now, and it says, Casino stood a lifeless ruin uh, when the Allied troops entered the town on May 18, 1944. Oh, it, well, uh, from Christmas to May. 20. After four months of siege, the Germans dug deep in its cellars and stone buildings held out stubbornly despite incessant shelling and bombing. This was the first photograph which was taken after the fall of Casino. Uh, let's see what, who took that. 196. What, what is it? 196. Uh, let's see, I keep losing that. Um, Wide World. Wide World. You see, there was a fellow by the name of Ernie Powell. Mm-hmm. He, he's in the world book over there. And Casino is in there under Casino, and it's under Monte Casino. In other words, it, in the olden times, I reckon it went by the name of Monte Casino. Uh, That's a good book. Now, well... Uh, so, um, I'm just a little bit confused. When did you get wounded for the Purple Heart? 3rd of August. 1943. So that was in Sicily. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then you came back and joined. Back in Italy, the the mainland of Italy. Yeah. And how long were you there? Um, well, I was there from. Uh, I was in Italy from. Uh, I guess it was October to. May, about the middle of May. In 44? Yeah. And then you got sent sent back? Yeah. They sent 500 of us back. And you called that a, a supply company or a relief? What? Well, the fellow in New York says, what is all these motorboat captains doing here? I said, that's not motorboats. That's a transportation corps, that pilot wheel. You know. Okay. So that's when you ended up in the in New York City. Yeah. Um, is there anything we've left out about Italy or Sicily? Uh, I seen Irving Berlin over in. Tell Italy. me about that. And Humphrey Bogart <laughs> come right up back to this artillery could have reached him. I met, uh, I met, I seen Marlene Dietrich yeah. come out of Italy. I seen Bob Hope. He come to the hospital there in Africa. Mr. Hope lived to be, I think it was 102 years old. Did Irving Berlin, uh, 
Huh? Did Ir was Irving Berlin performing? Or? Yeah. We just happened to go right in there on load in uh, Naples. And of course, Blunt was on up, and he had a, a boy with him. I forget his name. It made these sound for these cartoons, you know, Porky Pig. Mm -hmm. or, that could have been Mel Blank. Well, it might have been. And Marlene Dietrich. Oh, she slipped in there on a tent on a rainy day there in Naples. And, you know, she done that German wobbling song, and I seen her for a week. She was 50 years old. She made an enormous price for appearing in Vegas, you know. Well, you, know, you want to see a little of this? Yeah. I'm going to have to turn this off. What What's your daughter's name, who I just spoke to? Linda. Linda, and her last name? Biggs, B-I-G-G-S. Okay. Her phone number, if you want me to You want me to uh, Telling me about when the Germans fell back, they took his wife and his daughter with them. I'd like for that to be on a... Okay, just a second, I'm not... Not getting... Uh... Tested here. Um, bu bu bu. It's now, um, the last time I was here it was March the 12th, if you can believe it, and now it's May 7th, so I'm sorry it's been so long for, for us to get back. But is it okay, um, you signed a release form last time. Is it okay if we just uh, add today's date to that one? Oh, sure. Okay, so we don't have to do that again. Um, and you wanted to tell me some more stories, and uh, you brought out some pictures that I didn't see last time. So let's just talk about whatever, whatever it is that's on your mind. You said something about Sicily a minute ago. You want to tell that story? Oh, I was just uh, saying in, in Sicily there, uh, the uh, Italian man uh, told me that when the Germans fell back, they, they took his wife and his daughter with them. Can you imagine people being that brutal? Uh, Oh, I just something on the lighter side. When we was going up towards the front in Algeria on a freight train and in these box cars that they called them the 40 by 8, they'd haul 40 men or 8 horses. And they just had the horses out of them and we got in them but uh, anyway just for something to do uh, one boy uh, these Arabs uh, along where they knew the trains had been stopping and so forth uh, uh, they'd be there and they'd, they'd want things if you had any soap or women's hosieries uh, they'd buy blankets and make their clothes out of them so this one boy just for something to do he, he didn't have any use for the money but uh, uh, he had a blanket and he had a, a a rope tied to it and he, he'd get to bargain with these Arabs and the train would go to moving and uh, 
he, he'd finally take it up. Well, yeah, we'll take this so much for it, and he would reach it out to him. And he had the blanket tied. And as the train got to moving, about as fast as the guy could run, he'd hand it to him. Then he'd jerk it out of his hands. Just, he didn't mean to be taking his money, but he just, <laughs> it's something to do. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that train throwed the brakes on right quick. And boy, that Arab, he fell like a car full of rocks. And that broke up that boy's game. But I, I just thought I'd tell you that. And before the train started, down below there, there was a olive orchard. And naturally, some of the fellas would jump off that wanted to do their mornings excusing. And they'd, we'd go off down there in that olive oil. And I was sitting there trying to to do my morning's morning, and up to there come two or three good-looking French women. I said, oh, I got to get up. I, I can't cut this. That might have been silly to tell you something like that. But you just, you just see things that would actually just so odd. And there in Sicily, Way on up in Sicily, they, 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 they left a German soldier left up in a little knoll with a, a bunch of great big rocks, and uh, he was left behind just to slow down our advancement. And one boy hollered and tell him says, you son of a bitch, says, you better come on down. And the he, put, put, put. he says, all right, you'll be sorry. <laughs> just, just showing them that he, he, he was still alive. They, they throw artillery right there in them big rocks. And he said, put, put, put. He just show them that he he was still in there. Oh, uh, you'd see some things that just make your life just mm -hmm. unbelievable that, that people would do. Um, go ahead. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, that's a day that I, I got hit in this other boy, and I believe I told you this before. I don't think you did. We went in this house, and the other boy was shot right through there. In the chest? Come, come out. Did I didn't tell you that? No. And it come out of his back back there, and we was right at this little house. And we run and jumped in there, and uh, we went in there, and uh, the, the man, he... It's right at night, and he he figured that the gentleman seen us go in there. But anyway, we went in there, and I pulled his shirt off, and I, I put some sulfur drugs on him, and the lady took the bed, bread off of the bed. They cook a lot of bread in a chimney oven, and I got him on the bed, and... Uh, uh, he was he was in pain and on a, a little later it was nearly night by the man he figured the gentleman seen us go in there and he, he was outside he knew they'd come back at dark and uh, he was in pain and I said Shh, we'll restrain him we'll have to get under the bed. So we got under the bed, and I, I told him, I said, they're right here at the door. And uh, uh, he was laughing, and the old man was laughing too. <clears throat> he told him, 
that we had done gone. So they believed him and went on off. Then it got dark, and a man come back in there and says, you know, I could understand him. He said, this you'll have to leave. Just a second. <laughs> said, you'll have to leave. If he comes back... <laughs> you, so you... He made the sign across the yeah, road. Yeah, I knew what he meant. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we went down there in this little branch bed, which I had a dream about it night before last. Mm. I, I was telling a fellow that was there to see if that house was still there. I don't know why, but mm. that's what happened. And uh, we went down there in this little low place and stayed that day and that night. Some of them said, uh, anybody know the way out of here? I says, I do. So we started walking and walked about a half a mile and we run into a Jeep. It took us to Peel Hospital. And, uh, I don't know, some of the boys from Brooklyn, they, they didn't, they'd never been in the country and they didn't know their directions. They couldn't tell an incoming shell from outgoing. There's good boys, but they wasn't dumb, but they just never had been out in the country. So it helped you that you had, you had grown up in the country? Oh, yes, yes. Were there other ways that it helped? Well... I know you were a good shot, weren't you? Sir? You were a good shot? Yeah. Uh, well, being a country fella, it, it, it helped out in a, in a lot of ways. I mean... Uh, uh, I believe I told you about when I was on the firing range at Camp Croft, uh, I made such a score that they sent a 6x6 six six army truck down there and got me and I rode back to the barracks that evening. But I don't know, I guess that's about all. Maybe I, I don't know, maybe you say, think that I'm said some odd things I don't know now you you showed me a picture this morning from Camp Croft is that right yes sir who who's the other fellow in that picture his name he was a Davis mm -hmm. and uh, he come from over in East Tennessee he said Sergeant York was my supervisor in the CC camps and anyway I, I I don't know what happened. We went one way and he went another, but I was up at uh, All Good, Tennessee. Uh, just a year or two after the war, and he was running a little restaurant there in All Good, so I met up with him there. And me and him went fishing up there, and he, he was just a country boy, but I just lost contact with him. I don't know what happened to him. You also had a portrait that you said was taken before you left for the service? Yes, sir. Is, wh where was that taken? Up in, in Nashville, up there, by a studio by the name of Thule Myron. They, they was one of the best. They, they took a picture of my wife before I met her, and it was so good that they kept it up there on display in their studio. Says we want to keep it here a while, and they finally gave it back to her. But they, they was just the world's best. They finally sold out to this concern. I forget their name in Chattanooga which they come over and took our church pictures in a book uh, every two or three years and mm -hmm. 
truly mild had been taking them, but they weren't near as good at, at making the pictures. Did you have a camera with you? Oh, no, no. Who, who took the picture of you and the Davis fellow? Somebody else, I, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the sergeant, uh, show them that picture of Ruby that I was talking about. Uh, uh, it might have been the the cadre, the sergeant there's picture. Or, uh, one of the boys might have had a picture. But I was so poor that when I went in the Army, I didn't have nothing much, but just my clothes. <laughs> you also had a couple of pictures of uh, logs. Yes. Uh, could you tell me about uh, when those were taken and oh, where? Oh, uh, uh, they, they must have taken uh, when they went to widen over the road, right on the left there, and also what is now the zoo, this railroad come across through there and it cut off just a little bitty corner of the, uh, uh, the old Croft home called Grace Mare. And we cut a couple of them there. Now, the Croft ladies wouldn't cut a tree for nothing, but they had to come down for the railroad tracks. And uh, we knew how to cut trees. We we didn't just start off with a chainsaw. We started off with a cross-cut saw. And, uh, that's, that's dangerous, just turning somebody loose to cut trees with a chainsaw that has never had no experience. So how old do you think those trees were? Oh, I, I would say it's probably 300 years, 300 years old. About what year were, was that? Uh, that was about, uh, well, now I was doing it. Uh, I was at the post office then. Uh, that was uh, probably in the mid-60s. You said those were your two children in the picture? Yes, sir. That's my daughter and my son. In there. What are their names again? Randa and Donald. Did, I, did they go along to help you? Uh, no, it was as close to the house. And the, uh, Mama come out there and took a picture. My wife says, I, I won't take a picture of this. So you were living near there? Oh, yeah, I lived in Woodbine. That was just, oh, okay. was just a mile from there. Um, how did you get from Africa to Sicily? Uh, an LCI, that's a landing craft infantry that let the front of them down. Mm -hmm. I think the fellow that invented that, Linda said she seen something about him down at New Orleans. It was named Higgins. I think they called it a Higgins boat. It, it, would, it would hold a about a company of men, about 300 or what, and you had a little cart of a thing in there, and about this much further, the fellow was above you. And uh, we left Tunisia about one evening. We got in it, on it, I think is it was at and uh, I think that's in Tunisia. And we stayed on it a couple of days, and all we had to eat was just, uh, I called it tomato jelani. It was tomatoes warmed up with bread mashed in it. That's all we had for a couple of days. We come on up there to some little port and docked, and there was a six by six closed in. It was had a back gate open and it was full of whole wheat bread and boy we got out there and we got us some of that he was putting it on a ship 
I think, but I guess he come back and thought, well, where did my bread go to? <laughs> but anyway, we went on, and I think we went across the Mediterranean about halfway, dark till it got dark, and then on up in the night, we took off and we got in there to a little place, little city, Gila, Gila, G-E-L-A, and uh, uh, they opened up on us with artillery and it killed the sailor that was letting the ramp down. And he throwed it in reverse, and we went around to another place and got off pretty easy. What was it like on the Mediterranean? Uh, oh, going across? Mm -hmm. Oh, it was rough, I'm telling you. It, that thing hit them waves. It was flat bottom. It sounded like it just breaking to any minute. Were you uh, concerned about making it the whole way? Well, I don't know. When you're that young, uh, there's certain things that you just you don't realize, you know. Mm -hmm. Had you been on the water much before that, in boats? No, here? not just just on the big ship or going over in this convoy. And it was rough. It was. I guess in March, and oh, man, it, it was so rough. I guess. And they gave me a job, and another fellow or two taking meat out of the freezer. And, oh, mercy, I'd had the measles up at Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. Uh, Oh, mercy, and that was a British ship in their food. Uh, boiled eggs, it just all but smelled, and fish with their head and eyes on them, and mutton. Oh, mercy. The day we landed, I asked one of the cooks if he'd cook me a steak. He said, yeah, old choppy. He cooked it, laid my mess cut, and it's red. Uh, you can imagine how sick you are. But, and going over in this convoy, they had a a uh, ship, I forget what it's called, it's just a little thing, and it dropped depth charges. And when they, they detected one place, it just, there was something following us, and they rolled them depth charges off of the back, and boom! Water would j jump up 50 feet in the air. Now, you said that you made it to a field hospital. Yes, sir. What was that like? Well, uh, they began working on me pretty good. Uh, I don't know if that boy that was shot through him, but the next day before we left here in this ditch, he, he seemed like he was feeling pretty good. Hmm. But they went to work on me and put me to sleep. And it says count. I think I counted to two. And they grafted some skin off of my leg up there on my shoulder. So it was your right shoulder? Yes, sir. Did it go through? Huh? Was the bullet in it or did it go through? I, I don't know what happened. It was just a, a place. And... Uh, they, they kept me there, and uh, they checked my blood pressure, and it was awful high. Uh, that day, I don't know, we rode some way back down to the beach. It was a long way, and 
there's about 20 of us got on a C-47, two motor plane, and went back to Tunis, Tunisia. And, Go ahead. and I uh, had several things. It was a matter with my neck and so forth, and they pulled my wisdom teeth. And, oh, I think they broke my jaw because I got a, a knot in there on my jaw. And at night, when it get cool at night, even in the summertime, that goes to the top. Throbs? Yeah. Uh, mm. I'd have to take a syringe and syringe it out. And I stayed there a pretty good while. And when I got out to First Division, I went to England to train the troops over there for D-Day, and they sent me to Italy. And that's where I wound up, up there in Casino, I believe. Mm -hmm. You've seen the tip end of them bombing the monastery when you was here. Were there uh, were there nurses at this field hospital, or was it all? Oh yeah, yeah. there were. Mm -hmm. So, um, how how far from the line was it? Well, say you got field hospitals, you got medics. Medics, it's sort of the infantry that if you get hit, they're supposed to be able to do certain things. Then you got field hospitals, and you got evacuation hospitals. And then when you got back in Tunisia, you, you got the general hospitals. So how long were you in the general hospital? A uh, pretty good while. I was trying to get my blood pressure down and just, my neck, that steel helmet was just, I couldn't, it just making me miserable, mm -hmm. and they was trying to find out that, and they gave me a up and downer. You know, I took some of that old stuff to clean you out, and they looked all around in me. In this article that you gave me, a copy of, uh, you mentioned something about New Year's Day. In 1943 about what New Year's Day what was that like we was March it, we was advancing up to casino but we was back far enough it we stayed in pup tents and that night oh it snowed and it's done this and that uh, I had my boots sitting out there and end of the tent and he fell down and uh, morning coming they was full of ice and I took my steel helmet and beat it out and took my helmet in and drove them on they had kind of got tighter and I told the other boys in the tent with me, I said, there's a house back right over there. Let's go back there and find some stuff to build us up a bar, dry our feet out. So we did. And about that time, it was dinner time, and there was a big artillery gun right there below us, about 200 feet. And I said, I'm going down here a minute. I went down there and walked up to the fellas in line for chow and talked to one boy a few minutes and I looked at him I said, are you from Georgia? He said, yeah. I says, are you, is your name Rogers? He said, yeah. So it was my cousin that I hadn't seen in hmm. quite a while, 20 years. Or... You see? You said here that your your boots were full of ice. Is that right? Yeah. Sure. So it, the weather wasn't real good in marching through Sicily, huh? Well, uh, it wasn't too bad till this. I reckon that front come through, and then 
the next day I stayed all day with him there in a, a tent, my cousin, and about night we took off up across this snowy mountain and could see Casino. So um, how did you get home? Well, uh, man, uh, several others, I was in such a bad shape physically, they put me in limited service and assigned us up to a, a signal outfit back behind the lines. But anyway, I stayed there about a month and uh, the lieutenant says, boys, says, two or three of us there says, get your things together, says you're going home. So we went back to uh, what to call Mussolini's racetrack in Naples and stayed there a couple of days and put us on a, a train and took us right into the docks. And they, Italian boys, 10 years old, when I'm said, ah, Johnny said, America. So we got on this small ship and went right back up through the Mediterranean to the Straits of Gibraltar, right into the Atlantic, and boy, that was dangerous at that time. And I wrote my wife, girlfriend, I said, don't write me no more. I didn't tell her nothing, but I said, don't write me no more until I send you a new address. Because you knew you were going home. Sir? You knew you were going home. Yeah. Let me switch. And where did you land? Uh, and how long did it take to cross? Uh, I'm not sure. Not quite as long as the convoy, because the convoy is just as fast as... Slow a ship. Uh, seemed like it was, oh, it was over two weeks, I believe. And was the food any better than, sir? Was the food any better than going over on that British ship? The food. Oh, we had good food, but we didn't have but two meals a day. And they announced. The day day landing when I was halfway across, coming back, and the water was so still there that it was just like a bathtub, and you heard how rough it was when they landed on Normandy. So, how did you feel about missing out on D Day? Did you wish you'd been there? Or? No, <laughs> uh, Master, you just can't wish you was in infantry combat. There ain't no way. You had enough. Yeah. You've done your part. I think so. So there wasn't any sense that you needed to stay around and finish the job. <laughs> and where did you land? And was it New York? New York. And all oh, that's so rough. The guys on the ship calling the MPs up there for whelpers and everything. They told us, says, boys, we're not going to let you off of the ship till you quieten down. You and uh, they put us on some old train coaches that had been sitting there. It wasn't fit to haul hogs in. And took us into a little camp. I think it was Camp Shanks out from New York. Got there up in the night. Mess sergeant come to the back door and says, there ain't gonna be no food here. Oh, they got so rough. 500 men. He just was glad to come back and says, yeah, we'll fix you something to eat. You take a soldier's food away from me. He ain't got much left. Did, did you see the Statue of Liberty coming in? Did you see the Statue of Liberty coming oh, in? Oh, yeah. That's the first thing you see. Uh, talking about a feeling. 
What was the feeling? Can you describe it? Oh, it just felt like you'd like to kiss the ground. Did you get any leave to spend time in New York? Oh, uh, we got on another train and come down through Maryland, right by the capital. Camp to come to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Mm. They processed us, gave us some money, and says we're going to give you three weeks delay en route, says it won't come off it annually. So they put us on a an old uh, truck. I think it had been one of these car haul and trailers and took us into I believe it was Charlotte and then we got on Greyhounds and went our own way and that's where I called them and that's the first thing they know about me being back. What was the reaction? Huh? What was their reaction? <laughs> I don't know I said this is Joe. I'm in North Carolina. Did they wonder why you were home? No, I've been over 15 months. And well, then what did you do when you got out? Oh, I, I didn't get out, honey. I, after the three weeks, we went back to Camp Lee, Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's at Petersburg. And they uh, put us on a train and sent us back to New York. And uh, it was just killing time for them to get this Edison building there in Long Island City fixed for us to stay in. And uh, we went to a little camp out on the island there from New Rochelle, New York. And uh, we stayed a, a few days there. And uh, Wax was stationed out there, and this Colonel Lynch was a commander. And he gave us some sticks of wood to drill with. We didn't drill; we threw them in the ocean. <laughs> Wasn't gonna do no drilling. During the three weeks, did you get to come home? Sir. During the three weeks of leave, did you get to come home? Oh yes. My mother, my girlfriend, my sister and her husband met us up at the old Greyhound bus station. What did you do while you were back home? Uh, well, I got married and we went up. and stayed with Ruby's people a while up in Smith County. And then I got back on a train and I went back up in New York and she stayed here. And I called her and at Petersburg she come over there and we stayed there about a week or two and I went on back into New York and she stayed there and worked at a place and then I, I run into a feller that his wife worked with her there they come up on a train what kind of work was she doing was she doing mm -hmm. I really don't know there but at National Cabinet Company in New York they made boxes that went in ships that stored certain electronical mm -hmm. When did you ask her to marry you? When? <laughs> I guess 
I guess quicker than I seen her. Was it was it when you got back, or did you know already that you were going to get? Well, back? I, I figured I, I mentioned getting married before I went overseas, but she didn't want to do that. She said my sister said I might become a war bride. Mm -hmm. So when you got back, it was oh, you. It was okay to get married then. Yeah, we went up there and. Franklin, Kentucky. You didn't have to wait. In Tennessee, you had to wait, I think, it's mm. two or three weeks. So she uh, went along with you as much as she could? Uh, huh? She went along with you as much as she could to be yeah. close up in New York? We got up there, uh, uh, me and this other boy by the name of Green, that his wife was with Ruby. and. We ran into a fella that says, I'll take you out here in Long Island and see if I can find your apartment. And uh, he did. He was nice. And uh, we found an apartment there with a, a man and his three girls. And uh, oh, I guess it is a pretty good place to stay, but I shouldn't tell you this. I had bed bugs, mm. chinches. We stayed there a while and we found a good place, nice place on out there, brother. What did you think of Long Island? All the people was good to us. The New York people was, the original New Yorkers was, I don't know if you'd want this or not, but then Long Island, they sent us over to a little camp right there in Brooklyn. And I had uh, Italian prisoners of war working there. Boy, this gets rough. Of course, they had a fence around the place. And at night, see, Brooklyn was full of Italians. At night, the Italian women would come up out to their fence, and the GIs would help these Italian PWs over the fence. So I think they come out to get them to help them study their Sunday school lesson. <laughs> So the prisoners of war had it pretty good, sounds like. Oh, mercy. Pretty good. One told me there in hospital in Tunisia, the nurses and the doctors, some of them got some leave and went into Tunis. He went with them to handle her baggage and stuff. <laughs> he told me, he said, they piggy pig. <laughs> I've seen it all. Did you ever know much about the prisoners of war down at Camp Forest? At Camp what? Camp Forest. Did you ever hear any stories about them? I wasn't at Camp Forest, but that's today. So what were you doing in Brooklyn? In the service? They uh, uh, had a great big place out there. And it, they processed all of the partial post that went to Europe. 
and they've had civilian women and men in there breaking it down and they had us out on a platform of taking it off of these skids to pull out there and throwing them in the box cars one after another. We done that a few days and we had buck sergeants, first sergeants. We chose a spokesman and we just sat down. And the captain come out there and says, what's the matter? So the sergeant told him, he says, most of us are just right off of the front line and says, we deserve something to do better than this. I got a job driving an electric set outfit and pulling these things out. It had a battery, mm -hmm. it had a battery room after it got weak, you take it in there and it set you another battery. Kind of like a forklift? Was it sort of like a forklift? Uh, no, it was just a heavy thing with two little flat solid tires. It was heavy. But my first trip, I liked to have an accident with. Some men, when you come out of the warehouse, had been working on some electrical. And some of that stuff fell down as hard. And I didn't see it, so I hit it with this front wheel. And the wheel, it just, what saved me, the box car was on up the end here. And that hard object, my wheel wasn't mounted. It just throwed my wheel sideways and mm. off I went. And what saved me, it was just the right distance at the front of this, which was solid steel, just went up against the box car. And I just put it in reverse and just packed it up. But see, their carelessness is like the cost me. So how long were you at this uh, camp? Oh, we was up there till the war ended. Well, so after the war ended, because we didn't get discharged for um, two months or what. Thirteen million men military took a long time. And so you got out uh, in the summer of 45? No, I, was, I think it was on the 2nd of November, the same date that I went in service. And you did the same kind of warehouse work uh, the whole time up there? Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Well... I guess I was just enjoying being alive. I mean, they're just getting some slave labor for seventy-five dollars a month. I mean, did your shoulder bother you at all? No. So you felt like you were healthy. Huh? You felt like you were healthy at that point. Your health problems had gone away. The high blood pressure and. Well, no, my high blood pressure never did go away. Well, what did you do after you got discharged? Uh, well, that Christmas I was hiring temporaries at the post office and I helped them there a while in East Nashville and delivering partial post and I had to work Christmas as well if you fellas it won't work Christmas day you won't get on no more 
So I worked Christmas. I made three Christmases out away from home. So, uh, me and my brother and his brother-in-law, we went to uh, Oak Ridge. They had a surplus equipment sale. My brother was in the service a while. He put in for them, so we went over to the sale, but we couldn't buy one. His certificate wasn't old enough, so we bought one that another fellow had bought. And <coughs> we got to... <coughs> 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 I went to buying timber for this base belt concern. Oh, yeah, and we went to cutting baseball belt timber and then got that winch truck and got to cutting these bigger logs. Hi, honey. And uh, we didn't make a lot of money at that. We just had to do something. Did you, and, but eventually you got on at the post office? Well, in uh, about 57, <coughs> me and my partner split up. And I got a job. Fred Rich Mill working lumber company over in Woodbine. They're living in best supplies. It was the hardest work I'd ever done. And after about a year and a half, well, I started going down and he had to let me go. And I took exam for the post office and got on there. And March of 59 and stayed there over 21 years well with my military and all it was 25 years service that was a dirty place to work what did you do for the postal service sir what did you do for the postal service Oh, I was a clerk. I had to put up all the schemes for city on Nashville, what street went to what zone, and put up a secondary for Northeast and Woodbine, what streets went to what carrier. Then I put up Arkansas, Alabama, Indiana, Tennessee. Mm. And right on the end, they went to paying you. They passed a deal that they couldn't send you home with your work to do. And they had to pay you for putting up the scheme, but I just got this on the edge of it. What does that mean to put up a scheme? Well, say Tennessee had about 700 and something post offices. And I bought a thousand business cards at a time. An old typewriter and typed out these cards and then you, you just learn them and then you go up to the scheme examiner and he gives you a test of a hundred of these 700 cards in so many minutes to throw them. Go to Jackson, McKenzie, Memphis, Chattanooga, Knoxville, Johnson City, and then he takes them out, and you got to make 95 out of 100 to pass it. I never did put up a scheme late. I never did fail one. So it involves sorting the mail? And well, the mail they, now they claim they're doing it electronically, but mm -hmm. you had to, to know where it went. Was this was this before zip codes came in? Well, a zip code just just come in, but 
they first started off with zone six, zone seven, zone ten. Mm. Uh, uh, let me back up a little bit. What what do you remember about President Roosevelt dying? Uh, it seemed like uh, oh, I remember it, but I don't remember just where I was. Because I think he's the one that had to give him permission to destroy the monastery, I believe. Well, it was April of 45. Oh. So you were... Oh, I, I was back home, yeah. Do you remember what the, the feeling of the people was like when he died? Well, you didn't have too much communication then, so you wasn't no TV to really after that. And of course, uh, a world of people thought he hung the moon, but... You didn't agree with that? No. Because he just sat back and let Japanese and Germans arm herself. What did you know about Harry Truman when he became president? Harry Truman was the last of the Democrats. What do you mean by that? Well, there ain't no more Democrats, they're just liberals. There's one boy said at the post office they would have to run as liberals or communists. They just very, very liberal. So did you like Truman? Well, yeah. I, I would have I would have voted for Truman. Yeah. His hundred and twenty fifth birthday is tomorrow, <laughs> by the way. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Um say so what was Miss Truman's name was Beth. Beth, right? Yeah. Beth. Um, did you think he should have dropped the bomb on Japan? Yeah. Uh, Tibbets died three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said he had no qualms about it. It, it's sad that it had to happen, but did you ever think you would get sent to the Pacific? No. They was getting ready to send some of the boys that just come over there to the Pacific. But you didn't worry about that in Brooklyn, where you were. Well, they wouldn't have took me back in the army. Because of your health? Yeah. I know some of the boys had to register again in a Korean thing, but I didn't have to. This article um, talks about how you you didn't get the medals that you were entitled to for a while. Is that right? Mm -hmm. When? Why did that happen, and how did you finally get the the combat infantry badge? Well, this field hospital they gave me the Purple Heart there, and I had them to send it home. But they never did get it. And then later, I got the combat infantry badge and a bronze star. And what was the bronze star for specifically? 
it tells our is that under metals yeah but it it was for when you were in Sicily I take it uh, that campaign it tells uh, under M Well, this says it was, uh, this certificate says meritorious achievement in ground combat against the armed enemy during World War II in the European, African, Middle Eastern theater of operations. But this is dated 1995. So why did it take so long for you to get the bronze star? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I know you've also been um, uh, active in honoring veterans from the war. You you made a donation to the memorial in the yes. bicentennial mall. Why why did that seem important to you to do that? It just did. I wanted my name up on a memorial. Why shouldn't I? Well, not every veteran has done that. I just wondered why, why it was important for you. Well, some things are important to some people and other things are important to others. Um, and I know that you were friends with, uh, you had some pictures with a, a general. General Mott. Uh-huh. Could you tell me about, when, when did you become friends with him? Well, we, uh, we hauled logs. His daddy in East Nashville had a sawmill over there, John Mott. And the fellow that I went around with, a lot older than me, a buying timber, he, he told me, he said, John Mott had a, boy that won a high medal in World War II. So then General Mott's granddaddy would be sitting around there. But anyway, I hadn't met General Mott himself until he become a city treasurer. Then he was chief of police. That's when this picture was it's Let me. city treasurer, mm -hmm. and he had an office up there in the War Memorial Building, and I'd been out to the VA hospital one day, and I just said to myself, I never had met General Mott. I'm going by and see if he's in his office. And I sat up there, and... I went up there, and he was in there, and I sat down, and I talked with him, and, and we become friends, and uh, he'd come out here and get vegetables. I had a whole little patch down there in the garden, and, and I'd go out to see him, and sit down and talk with him, and I carried my friend over here that was a prisoner of war. I carried him out there, and I asked General Mott, I said, do you enjoy company? And he said, yes, bring them out. So I carried my nephew out there. They met him and we become friends. And I met his daughter, Miss Cold, out at the dedication. Your generation of Americans has been called the greatest generation by Tom Brokaw. Do you think that's right? Well, you know, I don't see anything wrong with it. Uh, uh, every generation, uh, I reckon, has their time and thing to do 
and to go through with. Of course, we never know what future generations will go through with. Do you feel like a hero? Uh -huh. Do you feel like a hero? Who, me? Mm -hmm. oh. No. All those medals and honors don't make you feel heroic? Oh, well, I, I'm glad I got them, but... I told them in New York that I had been presented a Purple Heart, but I says I sent it home, and they didn't get it. So they presented me with another one, and that, that's how come me to get. Then I went up here to the veterans of foreign affairs, and they said, well, you haven't got your medals. They didn't have no more. So there they sent them again. So I don't know why. I asked them, I said, up there, do you want me to send this one back? He said, no. Did you know anyone in the service that you would call a hero? No, I, I was with one that had come back to New York and uh, he'd received a silver star, but he wasn't with my outfit overseas. That's next to the Distinguished Service Crow. They asked him one day when we fell out to go to march to work on Long Island, he says, why don't you, his name was Camel. Like the animal? Sir? Like the animal? Camel? Or Campbell? My camel. No, 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 no. Camel. 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 C-M-P-B-E-W. Okay. Camel. And uh, he says, why won't you march to work up there with the boss? He said, sir, I'll tell you says you do well to get me to work when I get up there. So I, I don't know if I when I didn't go from my apartment straight to work I'd take off marching up there and I'd <coughs> fall off get in the subway. Mm -hmm. Nickel. So there's a sergeant taking us up there. He was marching to his neck and probably had a wooden leg. When I got up there, he come over to me and says, what's your name? I said, now, Sarge, just take it easy. I said, I'll give anybody in the U.S. Army my name. But I said, what are you getting out of, of marching up here? And your leg like that. And I talk with him and I says, now my name is PFC Joe B. Davis. So that ended that. Um, you can drive men so far and they don't drive no further. Did you have a chance to enjoy uh, New York City? Oh, man, my wife and this other couple was a room and with we went out to the Statue of Liberty and walked up in the arm of it and we went to the Bronx Zoo and uh, we went to the Radio City we went to uh, Madison Square Garden and Roy Rogers and Dale Livings was there at the rodeo and uh, that Radio City, they had a thing at the, uh, 10 years later, they had that in State Program called Dancing Waters. You ever hear of that? No. This German spent a quarter of a million dollars. It was a thing 
rigged up out of pipes. They throwed water through it to play in with music, and it was called a dancing waters. And the different lights throwed over on that water, and it was it was beautiful. We went up on top of the Empire State Building. Some civilians up there tried to get me and some more boys to go fishing with them one day, but I, I didn't go. Have you been back to Europe since the war? No. Have you wanted to? Well, I'd like to be there or been there per se, but I wasn't a flu. You don't like flying? No. So you have you been curious what Monte Casino looks like now? Well, I got some pictures of this Mib. What it looked like looked like the city, the south part of it, had built up. Well, what has uh, serving in World War Two meant in your life when you look back on it? Well. I don't hardly know just how to explain that. It's, I didn't look forward to going. I was just a country boy and never been away from home. I didn't want to leave my friends. I didn't want to leave my mother. But you did. Yeah, they said be up here at Union Station at 2 o'clock on Saturday. Did you know anybody who uh, resisted or... Huh? Did you know anyone personally who objected or resisted the war? No, at basic training, there was a boy that must have had his mother to ride him and... Later. Oh, there was an officer come in there and talk to him like he was a dog. He ought to have done that. I mean, that was his right. And, you know, you don't argue with anybody's rights. But I reckon they must have sent him back home. So you didn't look down on people who objected to the war? Huh? You didn't look down on those people who objected for moral reasons or whatever their reasons? Well, I don't know. There's some movie stars that didn't go. There was one that was an upcoming movie star by the name of Lou Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S. He, he wouldn't go. And that run his entities. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about these, this fellow's rights, what do you mean it was his right? Well, it's his... It, He's he's got an obligation to go, but he he's he's got a right not to go. I mean, did that sound odd to you? No, I'm just wondering. Um, I I'm not sure I've ever heard anybody put it that way. You had an obligation to go, but you also had a right not to go, but still you went. So what's the difference between you and this other fellow? Well, I, I wasn't going to refuse to go. But for those who did, you, you felt like it was their right to do that. Sir? For those who did refuse to go, you felt like it was their right to, to refuse. Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't know. I reckon they just expect somebody else to protect their freedom. But mm. So you felt like you were protecting the freedom of the country? When you go? Mm -hmm. Well, sure. It's 
Sure. Are you uh, proud of your service? Well, country? sure. What haven't we talked about that we should have? Anything? Well, I can't think of anything. Well, I appreciate you visiting with me twice now. I'm sorry it's taken so long. I'd, I'd like you to see that 30-minute program of the 25th mission of the okay. Bell of Memphis. Let's watch that while Matthew's finishing out there. I think he's, he's uh -huh. still... <laughs>